Okay, my clock just ticked 8 a.m. here on the East Coast of the U.S. So uh, welcome, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, good night, uh, wherever you are. I'm Kathy Morrison, I'm the chair of this morning's session. Let me just remind you that we are going to um, have the questions and answers in the chat function. And if speakers you know, go a little over their time, then there'll just be less time for a question and answer. So I'm delighted to uh, you know, announce that our first paper is a, a big overview of the project by Marie-José. Marie-José, over to you. Oh, it was fast, Cassie. Yeah, yeah that's, there's much. nothing more to say, I think. <laughs> I will try to share uh, screen. How does it work? Do you see my presentation? Yes, perfect. Great. So I see the same. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Everybody, I also welcome you uh, very much to this last conference of Pages uh, Land Cover 6K. I want to thank Cathy Morrison and Shed Hill so much to have organized this since long, first as a hybrid, or first as a, we were already thinking about this before the the pandemic, so it was first as a conference in Philadelphia, uh, and finally a, a whole um, online. So, and I am extremely uh, thankful to Chad Hill for all the hard work of the last weeks of setting up the, the final program. Yeah, this is always quite difficult. Um, so it's, it's also a mix of joy and sadness for me to introduce this conference, because as I said before, uh, we, it's a joy that we gather all of us here and that we'll, we will enjoy to uh, listen and discuss a lot of exciting lectures, uh, but a bit of sadness also because we can't meet uh, physically. It would have been so nice. Uh, and we were looking forward to be in Philadelphia <laughs> once. Um, and also some sadness because it's the end of a long adventure of seven years of collaboration that has been great. And I know we will continue to collaborate, but I mean, this, this working group is, is finished. So you see my next slide. I just checked that it's, it's working, Chad. Yeah. So here you see the, the, all the names of, of the very uh, valuable and yeah, fantastic helping coordinating people a coordinating group that has, have, has had a, a variable number of, of members through the years. But the last two, three years, we, we were 13 members with, with seven senior researchers uh, to coordinate the, the global uh, pollen-based land cover and archaeological based land use. And we had also six early career researchers um, in the fields of land use and land cover. So why land cover 6K for, for climate modeling? Uh, because vegetation is part of the climate system and uh, climate change will uh, Im imply change in vegetation that in turn will feedback uh, via biogeochemical and, and biogeophysical effects onto climate. Uh, nevertheless, if humans that can also inf uh, uh, impact on vegetation 
uh, in particular uh, uh, with deforestation. It will also impact back on climate via the same effects, but it is called now a forcing. It is a, a climate forcing. Then why wanted to focus on past land use and land cover? Uh, it's of course uh, for the purpose of paleo climate modeling, paleo in the past. And why is paleo climate modeling uh, so important? It is of course to understand the climate system in the past, but not only this, it's also to look into how well the climate models are simulating climate uh, and different types of climate, and not only the climates we have today, but the climates we had in the past. And if we can better un understand uh, the climate of the past, if we have better models, better and better, um, then we will better understand today's climate and achieve better projections of future climate. So what we have been focusing all the time during this uh, initiative, it is of course land use as a climate forcing in the past for, for the present and future. So if I take some history, why, why did we think there was a good potential to start such an initiative? Uh, it is very much because already before 2015, when we started, there, there was a, a accepted or people understood that we had this need to have um, empirical data on past land use and land cover in pages. So before 2014, um, Pages was organized as, as foci, so there was different focus, and all of them were climate, climate research, <laughs> very, very long. And then uh, at some stage, Frank Oldfield introduced the human dimensions, uh, finally, and he saw that it was very important to look into the interactions between human and climate and and the effects on ecosystems. So uh, they started working groups on fluvial, lake and terrestrial ecosystems. It was John Deering that was coordinating very long this terrestrial ecosystem. And then uh, after a while, there were also overarching themes uh, with among others land use that I was coordinating with, with uh, Shinya Sugita and Scott Mooney. Uh, in Australia, uh, and it was at the time mainly Poland-based uh, land cafe we were working with, but we, we were already thinking that we have absolutely to attract archaeologists. How are we going to do this? So it was difficult at the time because Pages was very climate, 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 and archaeologists were either not not aware of pages or not especially interested. So from 2014, there was a reorganization of pages structure and a new system for working groups. So this foci disappeared and uh, they made a big call for new working groups uh, that would be more focused. So we, we saw this new potential to really focus on this issue of reconstructing land, land use and, and land cover in the past and to attract archaeologists. So in autumn 2014, we applied for global land use and land cover. And it was in February 2015 that we, we were la launching this uh, working group. So we organized ourselves about like this. It's a bit of a schematic way to, to show how we were. <laughs> Uh, organized from the start in five la large regions with their coordinators. There were many coordinators for different regions um, and uh, four main activities. So the, again, the Poland-based land cover, 
the ecology based land use. Um, and then we have with us, of course, the, the um, modelers of uh, land, co land cover change uh, with Hyde and, and Kiki and uh, collaboration with, with uh, climate modelers, especially to be to make sure that we were uh, producing or yeah, achieving products that would be uh, useful for them, because this was the whole uh, goal of them. So of course, the, there were a lot of challenges from the start. Uh, I would say, in my perspective, the, 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 the most huge challenges were for the, was for the, the archaeologist, because there were no methods available to, to scale up archaeological information to a scale that was relevant for climate modeling. Uh, there were, was, in my opinion, I don't know if I, I say this right, but you will say this afterwards, Cassie, but there was, there was no global network of archaeologists that were working specifically on upscaling in, in this way. So it was really to start from the scratch, from scratch, uh, to build up a, a network uh, global that would be interested in, in working with this. For pollen-based land cover, it was, a, it was easier in, uh, on these two points because there was already models uh, that, that were available and, and partly tested. We had already uh, made a pollen-based first land cover reconstruction for, for Europe. Uh, uh, that was done for climate modeling. And we already had an existing uh, global network of palynologists that, that were working, interested in this and working with uh, pollen vegetation modeling. The major challenges for us were more, and you will see this, uh, to get the model parameters and in particular pollen productivity, productivity estimates that at the time were uh, existing mainly for, for Europe, and then they became much more um, um, common in, in China, but there, there are still few values elsewhere. Uh, and then another challenge is interpretation when it comes to separate human from climate-induced vegetation. Um, and finally, I don't see my slide. What have I <laughs> written down there? A ah, spatial density of, of um, appropriate pollen records. Uh, this is also not regular over the globe. And uh, the best is uh, Europe. The, the largest density is in Europe and, and uh, America. And it, it also can take time to increase the number of pollen records uh, that we can use and that are not already in databases. So it's a lot of work to uh, look for more pollen records uh, and uh, contact authors. It doesn't want to move. Oop. Next. So this is, this is a map that you will see again. Uh, again. Um, this is a, the state of the most intense, the regions of most intensive work in this initiative, and you see the squares that are yellow with a bit reddish in it. It's for the published, soon published archeological based land use. Uh, when it's dashed, it's in progress. And we have the same system for the published, soon published uh, reconstruction of land cover, pollen based, that is in, in bluish, light bluish. And um, 
you can see that there are there are few areas where the two are um, uh, overlapping. So it's mainly Europe, we have uh, where you have both, and uh, China, uh, Near East. But then it's uh, it will come, <laughs> but it's on its way. <laughs> so you see that it's a lot of work left. <laughs> Uh, and you maybe wonder what are these small, small uh, crosses? This is places in the because you see, yeah, I should have said for the for pollen uh, based land cover, it's done mainly in northern hemisphere, and this is very much because all the development of this model started in the northern hemisphere. So in the southern hemisphere, you have very little. You see two small squares. Here with reveals reconstructions in in, uh, in Cameroon and in south southeastern India, and then you have these crosses. These are studies of pollen productivity estimates. So it's it's coming, it's developing now. Uh, so it's it's really uh, I am happy about this. Um, Cathy will, will uh, present a bit more of the global uh, state of, of the uh, land, land use archaeological based. Just, I show just this to show you that the, the largest synthesis uh, of uh, Rebeat's estimates of land cover is, as I said, for the Northern Hemisphere. This is north of 40 degree that was published in Pages mag magazine in 2018, and it it was um, it was based on the Chinese uh, first Rivis land cover that is published in, in uh, Lietal by Phil um, Then it was based on on the reconstruction by uh, Sao et al. Uh, for north of China and west of China, Europe. It was based on the on the reconstruction that was published in 2015, and in America, it's a publication that is so so submitted. Uh, as you see, there is a new European uh, reconstruction that is in review and that goes down to the Mediterranean area and a bit more eastwards. Mm, sorry, I have some difficulties sometimes to change the slides. It's it stops. Mm, no. Huh? So what next? Uh, my view or my vision <laughs> is that the process will continue. I wanted to start a process in 2015 with my colleagues. We started the process and now it continues uh, in current and future projects in various collaborative constellations. And there, there, are, there are now some products available. So we can start to, for instance, put together archaeology based with pollen based land cover. And we can start with Europe, Near East, and China. Uh, we can do model data intercomparison between LULC scenarios and pollen-based land cover, starting with North Hemisphere. What I see becoming a global uh, product very soon is the archaeology-based per capita land use database. Um, pollen-based land cover will take more time to become a global, pseudo-global product because the Southern Hemisphere is still taking some years, I would say. Um, and then we have the collaboration that has started with, with uh, Earth System Bonellas and Vegetation Modellers, and, and we will hear about this, uh, this conference. So I, I will stop in saying that this conference will be about presentation and discussion of Slenkam 6K products. 
and use of the products for model evaluation and development and for pilot studies in a few examples. And an acknowledgement, so I don't forget, uh, extremely thankful for all the support we have got from pages for numerous workshops in over the globe uh, support from inqua reg regular support also from from the second phase at least for, of, of and all the national research agencies that have made possible for all of us to do some research relevant for this initiative. Of course, we do other research beside this also. So thank you. This was what I wanted to say. You are muted, Cassie. Now it's okay, Cassie. All? Oh no. I can I can uh, chair otherwise. Are there questions? Nothing in the chat. So you know you can you can ask question in in the chat everybody yes we also need kathy to um her sound so she can present the next paper yeah exactly <laughs> my god you can bear with her for a minute thank you very much uh, marie jose Sorry. Thank you very much for uh, giving this introduction. Um, yeah, you're welcome. The project. Thank you. I need to unmute you. I don't understand why she can't unmute herself. Ah, because, uh, sorry, Kathy. Okay, yes, the host was not allowing participants to unmute themselves. Because, because you changed. I, I switched to another computer because my right. computer started giving me some strange um, error message, which turns out to have been legitimate. So uh, in any case, uh, I'm back. We have a couple more minutes. Uh, we can go on to the next paper or if there are any questions. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen then although I switched to another computer, so it's a little extra exciting. Um, hold on a minute. Okay. We are in time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, can you see this? Yes. Yay. All right. Excellent. So I have actually am presenting the next two papers, but I did put them all into one single PowerPoint. So we would hopefully minimize the kind of um, technical glitch that we just have. So the first paper I just wanted to review for those really for those who are less familiar with it, some of the kinds of strategies that we used for trying to scale up the big problem that Marie-José pointed out, um, work with archaeologists across the world and scale up archaeological data. So I mean, I think that uh, this is, uh, you know, well known and Marie-José just said, but the you know one point that we want to make is that human land use as well as land cover um, is important for understanding both climate and for understanding human history. So the land use groups work of our land, our group is in the sort of green box, 
but obviously we it's connected to everything else okay and it's covering up my thing okay oops okay so and so archaeological data are on past land use are extensive and there are really you know hun over a hundred years worth of research um, on uh, the impact of human beings on the the earth system. So it's not the shortage of data in some ways, it's really just a problem of trying to synthesize and aggregate in a consistent way. So one of the first things that we faced was trying to come up with some kinds of language, shared language that could be used for um, the entire Holocene and for all parts of the world. So we spent an awful lot of time developing this classification, which I'll just briefly show you. And one thing that's important to, to note, though, is that unlike the um, pollen side of the project, where really everybody is doing pollen analysis, on the archaeological side, um, assessments of past land use practices are based on multiple lines of evidence. And those that evidence can be, uh, you know, there could be more evidence, say, for example, from archaeological plant remains in some parts of the world because of research traditions. Um, some time periods uh, and regions may have texts. I mean, so we have sometimes uh, highly diverse forms of evidence that have to come together to assessment of, of past land use. That meant that we ended up really having to do a kind of top down classification for the most part. Um, except for radiocarbon dates, which are you know, much more commensurable across the globe. So the challenges for data synthesis at large spatial scales uh, you know, are many, um, but one is of course that there are inconsistent and often regionally or temporally specific terms and highly diverse practices, like for example, all of these agricultural regimes you see here are often described using the same terms. So although it seems a little perverse, in some ways we spend a lot of time just really carefully defining common words in the literature that are not used consistently by uh, in the same way at different times and places. So we wanted to make sure that when we're classifying something, we're all actually talking about the same thing. So not only sometimes are highly diverse systems uh, named using the same terminology, suggesting that we would want to have more differentiated terminology, but it's also the case that in different parts of the world, similar land use practices are sometimes described using completely different terms. So I have in um, Chinampa, sort of Aztec Chinampa on the right, and a similar kind of agricultural practice that we see in Bangladesh today, right? So scholars in these different regions typically don't interact with one another and don't use the same term terms for, you know, what are in fact very similar kinds of, of practices. So we had to deal with that kind of, that kind of um, issue. So the land use group, and I'm just, uh, you know, there will be much more to hear in the conference, um, did a number of things. First of all, we developed a global hierarchical land use classification uh, and definition of specific variables that we coded. I'll tell you about more about that in a minute. Um, we developed specific data analytic methods that will be discussed in other papers. And then we have been developing a global land use database um, again, and you'll hear more about that in other papers. But I will make the quick point here about our spatial scale. And you can see the map uh, here nicely developed by Chad Hill um, that shows in the circle, red circled area is the eight by eight kilometer grid square size that we're using for the land use mapping. So it's extremely fine scale mapping. Um, and of course, for specific time slices that coordinate with the land cover work. You'll hear about the per capita land use work in other papers, um, but I just wanted to give you a quick overview of, of the kinds of activities. This is the product. Um, I think most people have already seen it, at least I hope, um, of the, the hierarchical land use classification at the sort of top most basic level. It's quite simple, um, but notwithstanding the fact that these are terms that are common in the literature, we uh, went to a lot of trouble um, defining them um, very precisely. That's um, and for some kinds of land use, we have you know, much more detailed, uh, fine-grained kinds of classifications available. 
Okay. So that is all outlined in great detail. You can read it yourself um, in the PLOS One paper that we uh, brought out last year. And the descriptions of the classification and the variable definitions are mostly, not entirely, but mostly in the supplemental material. But it's also worth noting that in that paper, we decided to present a fully worked out example of showing how this land use classification um, system, uh, how the database works. And uh, we presented uh, a map and the data, of course, um, at 6,000 years ago for uh, the Middle East. So that's now out. Besides the classification um, of land use types, according to small grid squares, the database also includes variables that are uh, as codes so that there's a kind of component and it really reduces the number of classifications, right? Um, and the variables include things like um, the uh, presence of domesticated animals, of uh, lists of crops and plants, evidence for large scale burning, if it exists, um, some basic information about technology like plowing, irrigation, um, the existence of uh, pyrotechnology. We know that um, metal smelting, for example, can use uh, extensive resources. And then, you know, basic kind of metadata um, elements. So that's, um, I just, this is by no means a representative picture of everyone who participated. These are the slides I had available on my computer. But I want to say that the um, land use classification, the database, and really all of the procedures that we developed, you know, for different parts of the world with radically different kinds of challenges of research um, are, are, are the product of a, a huge number of people working together and cooperating. And we really want, want to thank them all. I'm going to just as since I'm the um, host today, I'm going to go ahead and go to the second presentation and then we'll take the questions at the end. Okay, so um, that is just a kind of a flying introduction to the archaeological land use uh, analysis strategy. And now um, Marco, Nikki, and I um, would like to just quickly give a quick overview of where we are now um, in, the, in the land use group. And of course, we'll hear much more about this. So this is the map um, that I sent to Marie Jose, and she made it much more jazzy. Um, but this is, shows the land use mapping um, where we are in terms of our current efforts. So the large red blocks are areas where we have um, results either published or soon to be published where the most work has, has been. Um, and all of the little dashed areas have um, are still compiling data. So those are all places where we do have research groups, um, but there's still lots more work to be done. And it's, you know, there's going to be a bit more um, time, I would say, to go. So you can see, you know, uh, we have done a lot, but we still indeed, as Marie Jose po points out, we have um, quite a bit to do. And then um, this is my last slide. I just want to sort of, you know, think about what, what we have done, like what are our accomplishments to date? Um, in terms of methods and processes, which has really taken most of our energy um, in these last seven years, um, we have developed, as I mentioned, the classification and the land use database structure and published that. Um, alongside of that, we have been using numerous radiocarbon databases, which uh, we've also added to. We've developed new data analysis strategies, as you'll hear about in some of the other papers. And importantly, I think that these allow us to create maps uh, in different ways, right? So there's not just a map, really, there's a data set behind it. Um, in terms of data and analysis, we have continental scale publications. Out, some are out and some are soon to be out. Um, and the problem of starting to, or the challenge of starting to link adjacent regions, regions is one that we are working on. So if you look, think of the map with the big red squares, there's some little gaps or sometimes big gaps between the squares. And you know, we would like to achieve more continuous coverage. 
Um, we have completed the per capita land use database and analysis, and that should be published relatively soon. Chad will talk to us about that. And then we've also begun um, systematic comparison to other models and uh, uh, to, to other reconstructions and, and to models. And I will say just two quick things, um, although I, I can draw your own conclusions as we um, bring this material out to publication, I would say that the comparison to uh, you know, the existing state of the literature shows us already, I think, that what we're doing is, is worth doing, right? That it's worthwhile, that what we see, even preliminarily, is that some of the kind of fast approximation approaches, let's say, um, are, are not very accurate. Um, and in particular, that the, the scale, uh, anal spatial analytical scale really makes a significant difference. And I think that the slow and careful kind of um, work that we're doing on eight by eight uh, the grid squares, it seems slow and deliberate, I think, to modelers. It seems you know, wild and fast to archeologists, but I think that you know, we have found a kind of um, middle ground um, that's really beginning to pay off. So I'll leave it there. I think I am, stop sharing. Okay, I am supposed to finish at 8.50. Oh, I was so fast. Okay, so we do have time for questions and answers now. Go ahead and put them into the chat. And Marco and Nikki also will can answer. I'm going to say the lack of questions is primarily, you know, I, from my point of view, it's morning and, and we need, I need more coffee, but I think maybe everyone is just getting warmed up. I'm sorry we're not in person. All right. Well, in that case, um, whoop, hold on a second. I thought I saw a question. Oh, uh, hi, Anupama asks, uh, is the land use data on India published? Um, Jennifer Bates is going to present on that material. We have the draft of a paper for 12K and 6K, and we're working on other time slices right now. So yes, we're working on it. Soon to be. That's exciting. And thank you, Anupama, for hosting the workshop, actually. That helped us to complete some of that. Any other questions? Earl, is there an estimate for when there might be an eight by eight global land use product? I don't know exactly when there will be a global product, right? So, um, you know, if you look at the map, you can see where we are right now. I, I think that it'll be a couple of years, but we will have a global product. Um, but we are definitely going to have, um, let's say, an old world um, map, global, sort of, you know, half the globe, more than half of the globe relatively soon. Other questions? You know, one thing I'd say, as long as I, you know, was so fast, I will say that the process of developing the processes of translating the highly disparate, you know, and scattered archaeological data on, on land use, you know, it was no, you know, was no small feat. And, and thanks to, you know, many of you, of course, we were able to sort of bring it in, into order and start to produce this. But it was, it was, it took a while, I will say. And we are at the point right now where we have um, some material out, the Middle East 6K is out, and we're right on the verge, I think, of getting a, a lot more. So there's a, the, there's about to be an avalanche, I think. Yes, thank you, Case. Getting organized is a huge achievement, right? Because we, we never did this before as archaeologists, you know, work at this kind of spatial scale. So, yeah. all right, I, I think, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Marco, Sorry, please. If I, if I get, just make a point that Absolutely. I, I, you already say, but I think it's really worth you to underline it in a sense. Um, when, you know, when we are thinking about databases like pollen, 
it's very straightforward in a sense, and I don't want to diminish Marie Jose's side, absolutely, but it's, you know, one database that is collecting the same way and is rather standardized all over the world. Problem here and there, but as a major thing, it is rather standardized. When we look at the uh, archaeological data, these are often not. They are different type of data because we have plant data, animal data, uh, technology data, uh, cultural data that they all can then enter into create that eight by eight, uh, you know, grid of, uh, of information uh, onto which a global estimate will be based. And so the huge work is to fundamentally shift from sticking our finger in the air and making an estimate, which has been already done in certain aspect with the archeological data, into a mapping that represent what is the available data from archeology span all over the world. And so that's a really humongous task. And I think that's you know, what, one thing that has to be, in a sense, considered from this point of view. So in, in, in the, the major, let's say, quality jump in here is not just to say, I think that because there is this and this and that, then I estimate that in here there was some agriculture or some hunting and gathering or some, you know, as much as I can be an expert on it or, and many experts around the world, but is the fact of base, uh, ba the basis of what we're doing is extrapolating that information from hard archaeological data and transfer that onto that grid. And so that's, you know, why it's taking, it's taking time. Just right. That's it. Yeah, and, and I think um, one thing I would add, and maybe I should have added another slide about this, is that the, the global disparities in research, which, you know, match global disparities in income in many ways, are um, reflected in the archaeological record. So there are parts of the world where we have enormous amounts of data and other parts of the world where we have much less. And so what we've found is that we've had to develop multiple kinds of methods. I mean, even though the, the nature of the evidence is the same settlements, plant remains, et cetera, so on, but the sort of way of working is different in places that have large published data sets, for example, um, and places that don't. So for South Asia in particular, as, as Jennifer will tell us, um, we, rely much more on um, in-person workshops and collaborations um, in order to really bring together disparate uh, you know, information that wasn't already brought together. Nikki, is that a hand up? Yeah, so I was just gonna add that beyond the challenges of uh, creating a common terminology, um, and just as a reflection of that, I mean, when we started to talking about this, at a European continental scale, we realize even in an area that we thought we all understood the same terminology, <laughs> there was considerable disparity, which was yeah. a, quite a surprise. Um, so so the, the idea of trying to create a common language at a global scale is a hugely challenging one. Um, and then the other thing I would also add is that there's an additional challenge because a lot of archaeological data are not located in any central repository. Any repository that does exist for archaeological data tend to be very regionally dispersed, uh, they're disparate, um, and we don't have the equivalent of something like uh, Neotoma or uh, the European Pollen Database. Um, and so just actually gathering the information has been quite a big challenge, uh, even for areas which are well known and understood. And I think also because archaeologists tend to operate within their own period specialisms, actually um, what we've been asked in this uh, particular piece of work to do is to harmonize our chronologies. So think about everything at a global scale at 6,000 BP rather than in the Neolithic or in the Bronze Age in different parts of the world, which could have different dates associated with them. So we've had to really think about our data in a different way. And also a lot of our data sets are not prepared with that kind of work in mind. So we've had to transform our data sets to make them, to harmonize them essentially in chronological terms. Um, and that has really pushed us to thinking about our archaeological data in a very different way. Um, and I think 
as an archaeologist practicing this kind of approach, it certainly opened my mind to a variety of different approaches that perhaps previously I hadn't really considered. So it's been quite an enriching experience, as well as sometimes difficult <laughs> and frustrating as well. Yeah. And I, I will say, you know, when we started this too, we had a kind of dual goal that we wanted to do the global land use mapping, you know, as part of the Land Cover 6K project and to contribute to climate models. Um, and I'm, 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 we're, we're, we've done some of that or we'll, we'll do more, sorry, hardly talk today. Um, but one of the secondary goals was to really uh, produce products that were gonna be useful within the archeological and historical community. And so in terms of my own regional specialization in South Asia, it's actually been a delight because we are able now to, we're working on these syntheses that really, you know, if we hadn't been asked to do this, we wouldn't have done ever, right? So it has a kind of um, other outcome, you know, that is in some ways not built into the project as well. Any any other? Marie Jose, did you have something? I thought you saw your little yeah, yellow well, hand. I, I, yeah. No, I just wanted to say that you 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 started to do what we we started to do uh, in in Poland. Uh, data in in the 90s i mean the uh, european pollen database started in in the 90s uh, and it was also a huge work to get organized <laughs> this of course right. because we also did not call our pollen times types always in the same way so it it, it was an, a very long uh, harmonization time of the pollen taxonomy and nomenclature and this just for europe and and then started to there were other database in other areas of the globe that started and so on and still today it's not globally harmonized i could say not completely well there there is there is a system in neotoma but uh, it's it's still difficulties, right? So each each time you are in another region, you have to have harmonize the thing. Yeah. Well, so it was just a, yeah. yeah. So imagine that you are twenty years time. ahead. It's, it's what I want to say. It takes <laughs> time. Twenty, almost thirty years, right? Okay. Well, we will just keep you know, slogging along. Um, and meanwhile, uh, Case, yeah. are you ready? Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see here. There. I hope you can see my slides. All right, here we go. So uh, yeah, um, I'm gonna present some slides about the latest version of Hyde. For the people who are not familiar with Hyde, it is one of the land use reconstructions of the past for the whole Holocene. And like Marie Jose and other people, I've been working on this for quite some time. In the beginning, all on my own, but luckily during this time period, um, I got uh, to know the people from Land Cover 6K. And slowly, uh, a lot of empirical data now is coming my way. And I'm trying to involve and incorporate all these empirical data now in my land use reconstructions. So I'm going to show a few slides uh, about um, how I'm planning and have been doing this, and also some uh, thoughts about the future. So very shortly, uh, like one of the slides of Marie Jose already said, I started in 1997 with a very simple database uh, on a regional basis for the past 100 years. Then I uh, moved to a spatial resolution of 30 arc minutes. It's like 50 square kilometer on the equator for the past 300 years. Uh, after a while, when computer power became uh, better and more powerful, uh, I uh, increased the, the resolution to five arc minutes, which is like eight, nine square kilometers on the equator. And then uh, after a while I was asked, and I'll maybe we can come to that later, if I could do this for the whole Holocene, because 
a guy like Bill Ritterman says, uh, humans already changed the climate much earlier, the past thousand years, and the start of agriculture was very important. So that's the reasoning why I started to do this for the whole Holocene. The 10,000 BC is rather arbitrary, but it's more or less the beginning of the Holocene. Now, the latest version, which is published, is 3.2. That includes croplands, uh, rangelands, uh, intensive pasture and extensive rangelands, uh, subdivision in, uh, of cropland in irrigated areas, rain fed, rice as a special crop. And um, nowadays, it's version 3.3, this is not published yet, but I will come to that later, also has uh, a first go at shifting cultivation and um, the first go of incorporating empirical, archaeological data, and paleo data. And but this is not so uh, of use for this group. I uh, also included a lot of uh, satellite imagery and uh, yearly data from FO, which is more of interest of the Global Carbon Project, where Hyde also delivers the data on. I'm also planning, maybe for version 3.3, but I haven't decided yet, uh, to include hunter-gatherers. I'll come back to that later as well. So first, what's new? Um, because of the cooperation with Atlantic of the 6K, I was able to have a new go at the onset of settlements, of onset of agriculture estimates. Uh, I got some data from INSET and from other places, RKO Globe. Uh, I also tried to have a first go at using reveals data, which might say something about open and closed landscapes in the past. Yearly population, new satellite imagery, and new output format, but that's not so interesting for you. I haven't looked very much at the updated land use per capita yet, but that's also still in the planning of incorporating the new estimates of the PCLU database, hopefully. Uh, some other things I have improved. Um, I now include a lot of uh, data on a subnational scale, which makes some difference in the allocation, especially in large countries which is for climate models and carbon cycle models uh, rather important. So it's a combination of subnational data and satellite imagery and going to the past that is not so relevant anymore, but that's kind of the, the scale I'm working on, on a subnational scale. That's important to keep in mind. So the onset of agriculture, um, I was lucky to get the first maps of Mark van der Linden for Europe and Eurasia. It's a radiocarbon dated uh, map which gives uh, me a kind of a first go at the first settlement. It does not say that immediately there is agriculture, but at least people were there and we have like a, a notion of, okay, like 1100 uh, celebrated years before present, like in the Middle East, already people will doing stuff there, probably some agriculture. That's the reasoning behind it. And you see this flow of settlements slowly moving out to Europe, to Asia, which is nice. And I think it's an improvement of the estimates I had before in uh, my database of 3.2. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, these maps are only for Europe and Eurasia. I'm uh, hoping to get one from North America, but it's not uh, globally. So outside Eurasia, I'm depending now at the RGO Globe estimates, isn't like a survey of a lot of uh, archaeologists around the world. Um, they survey was questions like, okay, where do you think in your region was the first agriculture? Was it intensive? Was it extensive? Were the hunter gatherers shifting cultivation? Stuff like that. There can be a lot of things to be said about this estimate, but for me, it was at least some help of trying to improve my estimates of, okay, where do I start with I am putting my people on the map and putting my problems in agriculture on the map? I'm going to say a few words about the implementation in Hive. So uh, first, I had to find a way, how do I use these kind of data, which is not um, trivial, I can say. So this is how I went about. Uh, this is first an example of map I would get from INSET at this point in time. You see here, this is the, uh, the uh, years before present, and you see these dark colors, these are like 11,000 years before presence in the Middle East. And then slowly the colors change and the orange and the red ones are the most recent ones. 
for having some kind of settlement in agriculture. So this is the kind of map I get. So the trick is how do I more or less translate this kind of information or convert into the height methodology? Well, the idea is uh, very straightforward, which I do like. Let's keep it as simple as possible. I just import it into ArcMap, reproject it. I overlay it with the height country borders to check if the projection is all right and overlay it with the subnational codes. And this is important because I allocate all my data on a map through these Azure codes on a subnational level. So I have a gridded map with height uh, Azure codes and codes, and all the information is attached to that code. So therefore, it's really important for me. So we have the first map of inset. These are this is an example of the subnational data of administrative units of height uh, varying per country. Some countries are very uh, coarse, other ones are very detailed. But that's the subnational data I got. And if you make an overlay, it looks something like this. Then you can create in our map with sonal statistics a table attached are the ISO codes, but also the information of inset. It looks something like this, very simple. Here are the ISO codes which Heights is using, and these are converted to BCE and East CE because I'm using that kind of uh, timing. The minimum, the maximum of the estimate, and the range. So how big is the range? And this is a mean. And as a first goal, I just use this mean going back to my data. Okay, so I have to adjust my uh, original estimates according to these dates when I could start my agriculture. It's as simple as that. And it looked like this. Don't look into all the Excel files, but I had to adjust. These are the original numbers. And these orange ones are the new ones, according to inset. And you see already for a lot of reasons, states, provinces, I had to go back. So 1,000, this is a thousand year time step, sometimes many thousand years back in time. So that already made, I think, uh, quite a change in some regions. Simply, uh, quickly going to the other empirical data I got from reveals. Um, I got some 25 time slices, and we had a discussion with Marie Jose. Uh, I couldn't use all of them. Uh, maybe Jose can comment on that later on. But uh, from uh, 7.5k before presence, I start using these kind of uh, uh, maps to kind of indicate. Uh, whether is it open landscape or not. And it is not said that open landscape is per definition man-made, but at least there is a possibility that it's man-made. You can also uh, reverse this. I haven't implemented yet, but I think I will do that. If it's not open, if it's closed, and for example, if the numbers from reveals tell me that more than 8% of a grid cell is probably forest, that tells me, okay, I cannot allocate Agriculture there is probably natural. That's the thinking of implementing this kind of data. I get maps of this this kind. So uh, they have done the uh, the making the, the the upscaling of the degraded points into a map, which is really helpful for me to get some idea of okay in these kind of regions the possibility of more open landscapes is much higher. Than in other dark blue parts, which probably is not open but forested or natural uh, ecosystems uh, like that. So I've tried to convert all these maps um, into a global map because I only work at a global scale. That immediately poses a problem. In that way, you can see here two examples because the information I get are just jigsaw puzzles but not for the whole puzzle, but for parts of the puzzle. So we just had to, my colleague Artie Beurs and my Artie is the, the guy who does all the coding. We came up with the first approach like, okay, um, we cannot put, this is a kind of a suitability map for each time step, put the other parts of the world at zero because then there will be no agriculture at all. So it has to have a value. So we put it on, uh, 1.0.1, uh, which is really arbitrary on the scale from uh, zero to one, but at least 
it's uh, it's not ruled out in the other height alloc allocation rules. That's the simple idea. And uh, where we have some information, we've normalized all this between one and that, then it can play a role. So that's the idea how we do this. You have to keep in mind, and I think I have an, uh, another slide on this. It does not change the allocation. It just enforces the allocation while the original height rules based on climate suitability on soils, uh, distance to water, we get a combination of suitabilities. Reveals only says, yes, this is this is uh, probably open, so it will enforce the allocation in that grid cell. If the original allocation of height does not allow propellant in the certain grid cell, it will not go there, even if reveals would say it's open. That's the only res restriction now how it works. So if the old height rules zero propellant, it will remain zero. But if Hyde says, yes, there is a possibility to have cropland here, then if reveal says, yes, it's open, it will enforce that. So probably uh, the height will allocate more likely in the grid cells where reveals also says as some agreement. So that height, how it works, more or less. Uh, some observations, uh, this is not only for 8,000, but this is just an example. Um, again, the discussion, um, when reveal says, okay, this is probably open landscape, it does not mean that it's man-made like this. This is could be man-made, but it's very arid regions, so maybe it's natural open landscape. But in other regions, which are more likely to be man-made because it's from nature, not really open. So that's how we can maybe go about it. Um, yeah, some words about Archaea globe. Uh, they gave me estimates of uh, all different regions in the world of different cropland, grazing land, shifting cultivation, etc. Um, for some regions, there is a good um, similarity between what INSET, for example, gave me. But in other regions, um, I am quite skeptical about it. For example, we have this in uh, Nigeria, in the uh, western part of Africa, where there is hardly any cropland or anything going on while in neighboring countries there is, which strikes me as very strange. The same they have for Eastern Europe. For a long time, there was no problem there, so I don't believe it, frankly. So I'm looking very crit critical at these maps, but if I don't have any other information, this is the information I'm using to have the first onset of agriculture, for example. Right, this is Nigeria. Okay, now some differences, and these are just first um, runs with high 3.3 for the deep pass, they are still evolving. So uh, don't look at this, uh, okay, this is final, but just to give some idea about what the change is if you use more agriculture or uh, archeological data compared to the ruling. You see in many maps, when I just use the, uh, the height rules, they had an, uh, like an, an, um, an, an tendency to spread it all out within the country in very low numbers, but it's like peanut butter, just smear it out all over the place. While um, empirical data uh, tends to concentrate more. And I think that is more like, okay, this seems to be a much better way in some sense. So different time slices, 8,000, 7,000 BCs. And you see the different what I strike, and I'm not sure what to think of it, but maybe you guys have a better idea that for a lot of regions, like 5000 BC, I see, according to RK Globe, for example, no cropland at all. I'm not sure whether that's trustworthy or not. I'm, I'm, I, I just don't know. And you see in other regions as well, uh, going through time, you see differences. And then slowly the Americas do come in. 1000 BC. And you see also here, it's not so different from the two versions if you proceed in time. So we see early phase, and in some regions, there you actually see the differences. Uh, this is grazing area. Uh, this is widely different. Here you see enormous spread, and here you see much more confined to certain regions. These are the alpacas and llamas, and I just, in the former version, I say, okay, no cattle. No, no grazing land, simple. So that these areas, you can see the change. 
and proceed over time, just to illustrate what it looks like. Um, yeah, so this is for me uh, really exciting because for a long time I did not have any empirical data at all. So for me, it's much more sometimes confirming or changing the allocation rules, but the main uh, uh, question remains um, how good or bad are the general allocation rules within Hive? They are general rules for the whole world. So each region has the same rules, which I know is not correct. But at the moment, I can't do otherwise. Maybe I have to look for a way of improving my allocation rules. And I have a slide about that somewhat later on. But that's something I like to pose here as a question. Is there a way in which we can come up, I can come up with better allocation rules for the past? Because in areas where I don't have inset, where I don't have reveals, I still have to rely on the height allocation rules, which are quite poor, I must say. And stuff like this. And anything goes, as far as I'm concerned, whatever idea you had, whatever data source, I'll just be happy to use it. Shifting cultivation, um, it's still in the beta, very early versions. Um, I started with uh, one source I found of the Heinemann et al. I think it's 2017 or 18 or something, who did an analysis on, based on satellite and statistics on, for the tropics. And that you can scale back. But uh, how to scale back? I don't know. How many shifting cultivation was there in the past? Was there more or less? I have really no idea. Archaeo Globe does say something about uh, for the other regions as well. When did it start? And when did it disappear? So that's maybe something I could use, but data is really a problem. Uh, I'm also planning to incorporate hunter gatherers, uh, but there I have to rely really on the land cover 6K uh, uh, products, uh, the land use mapping, uh, the database, and maybe other sources. Uh, again, ArcgeoGlobe has some estimates on when, but where. I think I have to rely on the maps produced by land cover 6K and maybe also, yeah, the, 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 the magnitude of uh, shifting cultivation, how, how many hectares per person were they using? I have no idea, to be honest. So that I really would like to have your information about. Of course, that's always what I do. I start very simple, very simple indeed. Just my first go would be at it, okay, like 10,000 years ago, okay, anything land area will go was available for hunter gatherers, except maybe the extreme environments like the Arctic uh, region, the desert, the very steep slopes, maybe some other parts. That would be my first approach of, okay, where would I allocate my hunter gatherers? As a start, I don't know. Um, and this was just what I thought of yesterday. Um, I'm not sure whether this is a good idea, but maybe because uh, you can do a cluster analysis now, with current land use and see, okay, what are the main attractors of land use? In the past, of course, it's very different, but maybe we could, in the near future, redo a kind of a cluster analysis based on settlements or something else. Okay, how close are those settlements to a neighborhood of water, uh, wood soils, the flat landscapes, etc.? So playing around with, again, some of the allocation uh, uh, the suitability maps I use in height, but then based on archaeological data. And maybe then I could change my allocation rules, something like that. I don't know. It's just an idea. So that's basically it in a nutshell what the status is of height 3.3. It's working progress as always. And um, one of the questions I also have, but this is for the whole workshop. I don't know um, when is the point when I can decide, we could decide maybe, um, okay, this is high 3.3 and we're gonna publish it. What should be in there? How good is it? Uh, or should we just say, okay, this is it at the moment because a uh, uh, network uh, project like the Global Carbon Project, yeah, they use already a draft version, a better version of high 3.3, not for the deep past, but for the more recent past and yeah, at some time you have to publish something because it has to have a DOI, et cetera, et cetera. So when are we um, satisfied or even confident enough to put a stamp on it? And okay, this is kind of a land cover 6K product. 
and we call it 3.3. It's an open case. And that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Case. That was um, e extremely helpful. Um, thanks very much. Do we have any questions in the chat? Nikki points out that there's more coming from Europe, and we definitely have more coming. Uh, I see Marco sure. hand up. Marco? But it, that's part of the discussion because uh, there's always coming I, more. I was just clapping the hands. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, there was a clapping, not a question. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. No, but that's, that's a, a, one of the issues I have. There's always coming more. And do we wait until what? But sometimes yeah. it, it, it takes months or a year. And at a certain point in time, I think we just have to make a decision. Okay, this is it. And we know it's not perfect. And it's not complete. We know. But this is just the state of this moment. And that's it. Yeah, this is definitely, I think, something we should talk about soon. Yeah, and because um, it's my product, but this is our product, so you should be involved in that decision. Okay, if, if people could, um, yeah, use the chat instead of the little hands, because I can't always uh, see everybody. There's more people than fit on one screen. Hopefully, Case, some of those questions might be a little um, clearer after the end of the conference. Yeah. Uh, but let's see. Um, no, and I, okay. and again, well, uh, yeah, I'm already very pleased that at least we are organized now. Yes. That, yes. that makes it much simpler. And, and I'm playing around with the whole process. And I think with the radiocarbon data and the archaeology, et cetera, the paleo data, I at least have some kind of a, a way of incorporating this in high. Right, so and you know that, yeah. sorry, the, d the date of first agriculture evidence that you're using obviously is, you know, not for the entire world. So um, our our work is, is showing, you know, some of that as well. So we can Absolutely. help you with that, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so we have a question. Um, thanks for the talk, impressive work. Just wondering if there's a way to incorporate some information about the land clearance derived from First Nations cultural burning practices. So about mm -hmm. yeah, landscape my, burning. Yeah. My first question would be, um, in which category would that fall? It would be not like permanent cropland, I guess. So it would be like open landscape, or uh, is it uh, maybe a part of the shifting cultivation or is it uh, extensive rangeland? So I need some some way of the indicators which I'm computing now in height to link to that process. So burning, really, is not, yeah. burning is not an indicator now in height. It's an important question and it's a tricky yeah. topic. I mean, we discussed this at length and we ended up not trying to incorporate it into a classification, but as um, an, an additional variable that could be added, um, you know, to any classification, which yeah. makes more sense in terms of the empirical variability yeah. of the practice. And of course, it's also difficult. Some some areas we we have a sense of, you know, burning happening um, on a large scale, and sometimes we don't, even if there probably was. So it also the, the the level of evidence is highly variable. Yeah. I would say, yeah. yeah. I guess it would might help me to at least uh, differentiate in some areas between open and closed landscapes. So it would be probably an open landscape, and probably also uh, might be suitable for some kind of ranging, maybe later on in in time, but not in the early days. Mm -hmm. And maybe in the hunter gatherers category, that might be very suitable. Okay, here was hunter gathering taking place more likely than in dense forest. I don't know, something like that. Mm. Okay, any any other questions, comments? Okay, that's great. Um, we are actually just two minutes ahead even, which is fantastic. We can really take a break. So um, our next paper is by Earl Ellis. Earl, you ready to start? You're still muted. Yeah, I'm ready to start. I'm just trying to see here. How can I get my slides shared here? One participant can share at a time. I don't see a, a sharing option. Maybe Chad needs to enable that for me. 
I made you a co-host, so you should have um, the share screen button. Share screen button. I have a share yeah. screen button. All right, sorry. Yeah. Oh, is that just showing up with uh, the slides, or is it my whole screen? Just we just the see the we just see the slide. It's perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you very much for giving me a chance to talk about my work using global land use reconstructions. And I will admit that I'm mostly a user of these reconstructions. I I, I let uh, Case and and the rest of you experts uh, develop these things for the most part. But I think that the process of using these is is just as important when you consider uh, the design of of the products. Uh, and so the first thing I'm just going to mention is that uh, the design of all this work as a supplement to basically classic earth system modeling for climate change, uh, I think is a real limit to how useful this kind of reconstruction is for biodiversity conservation, which is an area that I'm very concerned about. And I think a lot of people are very concerned about. Uh, and the reason is land use is really at, it's considered to be the number one cause of changes in biodiversity, including extinctions. Uh, and there, there's a tendency to ignore the fact that actually a lot of indigenous and traditional land use practices don't actually cause these problems. It's more recent land use changes that have caused these problems. And so we need to think about how early land use could have sustained and shaped, maybe even increased biodiversity. And so I, I'm going to talk about how global land use histories can be used for biodiversity conservation. Um, so there's a grand concern that we are living in this time when very recently we're seeing this uh, massive loss of species. And there's no question among conservation ecologists that land use, and especially more intensive forms of land use, are responsible for this. Um, so things like uh, the deforestation of Amazonia are looked at as the cause of a lot of these things. But I think that that, that evolves partly from a kind of misunderstanding among uh, conservation scientists who are mostly trained biologists. They don't understand the deep history of, for example, tropical forests, that there's an archeology span that shows that people have been living in and using, say, for example, Amazonian forests for thousands of years in most regions, and that contemporary patterns are not representative necessarily of the patterns over the long term that shape the biodiversity that everyone is talking about trying to conserve. So we need to have a deeper understanding of these things and, and the global land use histories are bringing that to the conservation community. Uh, and so the, uh, we'll, I will talk about some recent work where we have used these global land use reconstructions to look at the potential that uh, we, we need a new view of how we do biodiversity conservation. So the classic view of the, the global patterns of life, you know, which areas that have which species and what kinds of biodiversity patterns we see is the kind of classic biomes, which we can understand primarily just as a function of climate uh, across the planet. Uh, and that gives you a view of the kind of a top-down view that you just look at Amazonia as just a, a tropical rainforest. That's all you need to know. But of course, uh, there's people living there. There have been people there often for thousands of years, not in necessarily in some kind of static uh, mode, but changing over time. And they have shaped the biodiversity and, and the nature really across these places. They're really cultured lands. They're not uh, wild lands. And for another example is uh, the, pretty much the, the last remaining megafauna assemblages that are more or less intact are in the Maasai Mara in Kenya. And it's called the Maasai Mara because this is the cultured lands, the homelands of the Maasai people uh, that are populated and used for agriculture, but are also some of the most biodiverse places left uh, in Africa. So, and, and just one more example, uh, and this, this may, may go to you, Case, is that actually uh, deserts and drylands are a common place for hunter-gatherers. It's not like, uh, you know, deserts are somehow exclusive to hunter-gatherers or Arctic areas. They, people have learned to live in all these areas and they've been living there for quite a, quite a while, thousands of years in many of the regions. Um, and Australia is probably the longest of all. Uh, but one fundamental thing that is becoming more and more recognized is the importance of cultural landscape management to the biodiversity that we see. If you stop doing these cultural practices like, like burning in a mosaic, uh, you lose biodiversity. 
uh, it's actually sustains biodiversity. So we need this more human understanding of the global patterns of biodiversity. Uh, and I've been using this concept of the anthromes for some time to describe that, that view that we need to understand these landscapes as not uh, some kind of just a simple biome, but an anthropogenic biome or an anthrome uh, in which the land use shapes the, the patterns of life. Uh, and fundamental to that uh, is this idea. We can still look at some areas as, as essentially without uh, dense populations, although I, I am confident that this number is, is wrong. Uh, this, this number, 23% uh, wild, meaning areas without any intensive use uh, and potentially without any human populations, they probably do have populations, most of them. That's one thing we've learned through uh, work with recent anthropologists. Um, but we still have about 40% of Earth's land is, is intensively used. But interestingly, there's, there's this other part, and this is the part where most of the areas that people are talking about doing biodiversity conservation actually exist. These are the less intensively and maybe not unused areas within the used landscapes. Uh, and the reason is, is because it's not enough just to understand how much land use there is in an area. You have to understand how it relates to the whole landscape. Biodiversity is really shaped at the landscape scale. A lot of wild species can live in a used landscape because it, the landscapes that people shape are generally mosaics of intensively used or less intensively used and, and areas that are almost not used at all, the, the novel ecosystems. Um, so land use shapes biodiversity, not just within the land used areas, but it shapes the landscape. So we need a landscape scale approach. And I did see that the eight kilometer uh, system, this square grid, I'm not sure how it works globally, uh, but this square grid is an attempt to look at a landscape scale. None of those eight by eight kilometer areas are completely used, I don't think. It's very unlikely. They're, they're some kind of mosaic. And understanding what's going on within those landscape mosaics and another term for that larger scale landscape, the regional landscape is an anthrome basically that has some form of use pattern and biodiversity patterns that are shaped by these. Uh, so what does global land use history tell us about the biodiversity of anthromes? Well, uh, as we know, there's histories. There's not one global land use history and there's a lot of uncertainties here. Uh, and so the first time I looked at this, it was just a comparison of the difference between Hyde 3.1 and KK10. Uh, and what it basically showed us is that uh, remarkably, if you look at the two, on the right, you have KK10 and on the left, you have Hyde 3.1. Uh, you can see when Am I the only one who sees, is, is other people, Earl is huh? frozen? It's gone. It's gone. Okay. Well, it'll probably come back. Let's just wait a second. Sometimes it just yep. magically fixes itself. I was bashing high 3.1, so I muted him. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll send him a note just to see. Maybe if he can still get the uh, message, you are frozen. I guess he's completely offline now. He's gone. Yeah, he is completely, okay. I won't send him a message then. That won't work at all. I guess he'll probably try and come back in in a minute or two. Okay. Um, yeah, so his talk is scheduled his his slot. Oh, no, he's back. He's he back. Just yeah. There he is. Okay. Earl, are you back? You're muted. Chad, do you have to unmute him? No, he's a co-host. He should be able to. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. I don't know. I do not know what happened. Something happened with my internet. Um. And I was going to show even. Can you hear me now? Uh, you can see that even here. Uh, in KK10, uh, half the earth is basically unpopulated uh, as of, uh, what, 3,000 years ago, 1,000 BCE. So clearly, uh, I, we think these are wrong. Um, so we did do uh, an effort, and there's been a, a lot of references to Archaeoglobe, at least in, uh, in, in Case's talk, make an effort to try to <coughs> evaluate these different systems just to see 
you know, is KK10 more right than, than Hyde 3.1? Or And in fact, we actually just compare with Hyde 3.2 based on the, the kind of a limited kind of field searching of the archeological community. And we came up with uh, some estimates of the global onsets for different forms of agriculture uh, and for the global changes in uh, hunter gatherer or foraging populations. Uh, and uh, one thing we learned that didn't surprise us at all is that even Hyde 3.2, which is much better at reaching back in time with human populations and agricultural use, even this assessment uh, essentially, uh, it, it puts the onset of intensive agriculture much later than archeologists do in most areas of the world. Although as Kay said, there's plenty of issues with our uh, Archaeo Globe assessment as well. It's not like you can just take it as the truth. One thing that, that I don't know how much Case has worked with uh, is that there is variation in the estimates. Every single region has at least three archeological estimates. And if you look at these, you might find that there is the correct estimate there, but that a number of people or the majority of people, which is how we assessed the mainstream version, uh, chose a, an incorrect uh, assessment. But what I wanna talk about mostly right now is just looking at uh, how global land use shapes biodiversity. Why is it relevant? Uh, and to do this assessment, we used high 3.2. So you're all familiar with that. So that was our source of input data. That's the five arc minute data set. Um, we rescaled that to an equal area grid. And we like to use an equal area grid that looks the same on the ground everywhere. Uh, pretty much all the projected units, these are unprojected. Just use the whole planet as a hex, is a, like a soccer ball. So they're all equal area. Uh, hexagons. Uh, these are about 100 square kilometers in size, uh, and it's to get away from the part. The problem with the five arc minute grids is that they're all different sizes and shapes in different parts of the world, uh, and that is especially problematic for biodiversity data because it is area sensitive. If you change the scale of the, the spatial units, the biodiversity data also changes it with scale. Uh, and to calculate, to produce anthrones, we, for, after rescaling the high data, we use a rule-based classification that we've used in the past, slightly updated to work better with uh, Hyde 3.2. And we did this for 60 time intervals from 10,000 BC to 2017. Uh, and the first thing we recognize is that we get a very different view, the green and brown there. And the brown is more or less the cutoff with uh, the wildlands versus the cultured lands. The light brown is a, is a cultured dry land. The light green there is a cultured Woodland uh, is that about three quarters of the world is inhabited 12,000 years ago. So we think that's a, a big upgrade in accuracy from 3.1, which again had it what we didn't get anywhere near this level until after 1500 in 3.1. Still, though, we already know that 3.2 uh, has its issues. And so this is just the best we can do right now with the data that we have. Um, just, just an indic showing that after you know thousands of years, we're starting to see some more intensive uh, anthromes show up. Uh, by 1500 BC, or sorry, 1500 CE, we're starting to see a lot of these. And if you look at Central America, you can see some uh, development there. And there's a lot of land use. Uh, it's relatively low intensity, but there's a lot of land use across the Americas. 1600, we see a lot of that go away. So there's some there's some interesting patterns relating to the pathways of human history that we are seeing reflected here. Um, and then by 1900, you can see a pattern that looks a lot like what it looks like in 2017. Things don't change as fast after essentially 1900 in Hyde at least. So that's our kind of a global perspective. If you're interested in navigating this, looking at the details, this is all available in an interactive map that even has, if you look there, it's got a play button. You can look at the dynamics in any place. You can zoom in, et cetera. I, I think this would be a, a great tool to use with Land Cover 6K as well. This was through help from Google Earth Outreach uh, gave us this tool. I highly recommend you check it out. Um, but what we were after was what are the human histories of the areas of the world that are prioritized for conservation? Uh, and one good example, of this is key biodiversity areas. Uh, what we found is that their land use history was very much like the rest of the world. It didn't look that special. Some of these areas that have been uh, identified by conservation organizations as mostly natural. I don't know exactly how to take that, but that is a global data set that is being used for conservation priorities. You also see a similar kind of pattern. So there's a deep human history to the areas that are perceived as and treated as areas of, that are just quote natural. 
And more importantly, uh, we did a statistical analysis of the patterns of anthromes at different times in comparison to current patterns of biodiversity. In this case, it's, it's vertebrate species richness, key biodiversity areas. But one thing that was most interesting is that actually the history of land use predicts the current patterns better than the current patterns of land use. And that's very interesting. Did those earlier patterns of land use shape the patterns of biodiversity today? That is an open question that we think is very important. Anyway, what we learned from this and is very important message for conservation is that uninhabited wildlands have always been rare. They're about as rare today as they were 12,000 years ago or vice versa, 12,000 years ago, they were also rare. Uh, that biodiversity is associated with patterns of past land use and that areas of, for conservation uh, are really, the diversity there has been shaped by long histories of human use, especially by an indigenous and tradi traditional communities. Uh, so indigenous lands are still an important strategy for biodiversity conservation. Uh, of course, indigenous people uh, have their practice Oops, looks like you got an unstable internet situation here. Let's just give them a minute. If anybody wants to chat while we're waiting, feel free. You could also add, if we want to get us started on questions for Earl, you could add them. Um, yeah, you, that's more. a good point, Chad, thanks. Yeah, if you have questions, you could just go ahead and get them typed in. I can tell that Earl has been working with my former student, Andrew Bauer, who got working on some of the same material that we're working on with biodiversity issues in South Asia. So that's all very familiar since it comes from our work. Hmm. Luckily, we're still um, on schedule. So 40. we're scheduled to, oh, uh, there we go. Okay. All right, you're back. Let's see if we can get this going. Yeah, sorry about that. Man, It's I haven't had so many problems. Oh, oh okay, it's back, it's back. All right, sorry about that. Um, haven't had so many problems with Zoom ever practically. All right, and so basically uh, that's pretty much my talk. Uh, that what we can learn from global land use history is that this idea of wilderness is basically a myth, this idea of pe places that are sustained without, nature sustained without people. Uh, but the main question I have right now is, can we improve our understanding of global land use history in a way that will inform uh, improvements in conservation strategy? So for me, that's a goal of using uh, these improved outputs. Uh, Hide 3.3 is directly useful. Uh, because it's a format that we're already used to using. Uh, I'd be interested in using any uh, global land cover 6K project that was available. But one thing that I am wary of doing because it produces biases is using uh, localized, highly localized and regionalized data sets because uh, generally these tend to be biased uh, by the types of observations that are possible in one region. For example, Europe has huge numbers of data points and therefore everything looks all filled out uh, versus areas that have very few data points and everything is kind of in between and it could just be data availability. So I like to see a data set that is produced using a kind of uh, regionally uh, consistent type of model if we're not going to kind of overprivilege some areas versus others. All right, thank you very much. And, and I look forward to, uh, to seeing as much as I can of the, the, the rest of the uh, land cover 6k workshop I'm, I actually have to teach in a little bit but uh, I'll be there for some of it 
Okay, do you have time for a couple of questions? I, I do. I have I have until 940. Okay. Um, any anybody want a question? I've got my little chat box open. Earl, I'm sure you would be interested in our volume, The Social Lives of Forests, uh, which makes many of these same points uh, from many parts of the world. Uh, so it's nice to hear a little political ecology coming in at a global scale. So thank you. Um, yeah, I'm actually familiar with that book. Don't. Great. If we don't have yeah. any, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I should just mention that one reason why that kind of work yeah. doesn't necessarily resonate with uh, conservation assessments that are doing priority setting and uh, strategizing for protected areas and just basic conservation as well is that they like to have these kind of global data sets. Now there's a lot of criticism of the use of global data sets uh, in this way, uh, kind of a, as a top-down framework for, for assessing you know, priorities. But on the other hand, that's exactly what these global land use histories are intended to produce are these globally consistent assessments. And, and I find that they, this is influential to uh, conservation organizations when they can see the world through a kind of historical lens. Indeed, and I'm sure, as you know, that um, policy work, you know, is always, uh, you know, specific to nation states as well. So uh, with our work in South Asia, we're working with a lot of ecologists um, and organizations like ATRI that are actively involved in policy. Um, so trying to bring this sort of human dimension, historical dimension into their studies of contemporary ecology and policy. So it's a complicated situation, right? Uh, on a kind of country by country basis as well. If we don't have any more questions, I guess we will let Earl go and we will also take a break ourselves. So we come back. I have, I have one question. Oh, oh yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't see a question in the chat. Rosie asked if it was recorded. Oh, sorry, I sent it to. to... Oh, you sent it. I, it's what not, what is up. the advantage of working at a global scale comparing to regional scale to inform conservation? Because I mean, there is a lot of regional scale studies, uh, archaeology, pollen that that really inform conservation. I mean, we we have done this since long. So what, what do you see as a plus that, that you have this uh, global picture? I, well, I, I, I'm happy to hear about this because I don't really understand. Well, there's, there's two uh, international consortia that are basically doing global work on conservation. There's the IPBES, the Intergovernmental yeah. Panel on Biodiversity and yeah. Climate Change. And they are interested in, in globally consistent assessments. And land use history is basically not included, I think partly because of the issues of globally consistent work. Uh, the other is uh, the IUCN and the Convention on Biodiversity also have global priority setting efforts. So it is true that you know, national policies are set by nations but these international agreements and the IP, the, sorry, the, uh, the CBD Convention on Biodiversity is currently negotiating the next strategy, the next level strategy for uh, conservation targets at the international level. Mm. And they are using global assessments of biodiversity patterns as part of their, their target strategy, strategies. Yeah. So with land use okay, history, so it's, it's yeah. not usually considered with a lot of these. Because so it's again, it's again a question to to upscale things that exist. In fact, I understand. Yeah, yeah. We are, I think we can all. Oh, agree sorry, I, I, I am I am uh, thinking for myself, but yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. There's the question. Okay, but so it's uh, it's also again an example where where paleoecologists are, are not working in in the in the international scenes where they, they should be there, in fact. When yeah. you say that land use were, was not in this, is not in this international uh, biodiversity thing right. that know so, about. So I think ultimately it's, it's what- right that we are not working in, in there. Uh, I mean, I, we are not uh, taking part. 
and it's it's a bad thing <laughs> for the paleoecologists are, are, are stupid uh, because we are not where we should be in the inter international thing yet. That's why it's going very bad for a, a paleoecology science in, in several countries. It's <laughs> Okay, and um, I mean, in, uh, in, in terms of support and so on. Right. No, so this, it's why I think it's interesting to, to discuss about this. Mm -hmm. so, and then Nikki it's, it's like for us, it's like deja vu and so on. And we, we are working with these things. But uh, yeah, we are, we are not talking to the right people at the so international. Just in to, the, answer, try to answer Nikki's question probably. before I have to go. Uh, yes. So the, to answer that question, I think the main point that the point where we're at with including global land history in conservation assessment is that one of the reasons it's not included is because we don't have these assessments that are produced in the formats that they can use. But just as important is the idea that it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Biodiversity crisis is recent. It's caused by you know contemporary land use, and we don't need to care about what was going on before. Uh, but I think that to the extent that we can show with scientific evidence that the history of land use in places is not just a statistically associated with patterns of biodiversity, but actually has shaped and, and conserved biodiversity. Yeah, exactly. At yeah, the global yeah. scale, I, I, I totally it will agree with you. Part of these global but, assessments. But for me, it's not new. It's why. I say there is something that is wrong because for paleoecologists, it's not new what you say. It's no, it, we, we've always. known about this for a very long time, but we've not really uh, yeah, put it yeah, together yeah. So in a it's, way it's, that it's, it's, it's is meaningful. Interesting what you are saying, Jörg. It, it's very interesting. Something. Well, what I've been doing is working with <laughs> archaeologists and conservation organization scientists and to, to kind of bring those things together at the global scale. And, yeah. and I think it is, it is showing, to, it's becoming important, especially as indigenous conservation has, has proven to be probably one of the most important forms of conservation that needs to be invested in uh, in the future. Uh, the, it, you know, there we have real you know, direct people who are, have a history of a place that are also you know, know how to manage these places and recognizing that with a history uh, and, and seeing places that maybe had a history where people were shaping the landscape, like for example, a lot of North America, uh, you know, biodiversity has been lost by people being forced off the landscape. There may be mm -hmm. some grounds for even for reparations and these kinds of things. But I think the most important things you have to work with conservation people at global scale, with global scale data, if you want mm -hmm. global scale conservation efforts to be informed by this stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right, everybody. I think everyone would love to have a break. Um, we will take a short break, 15 minutes or so, and please come back. Uh, we will restart at 2.55 Greenwich Mean Time. So see you soon.
package and you know so far probably the expected number of weird technical glitches indeed i didn't think my new computer um what do you call that microphone was going to do that that was a little weird i know it's a little risky to use a new computer for a presentation hey jb nice to see you hi how are things you try any other really interesting new foods Lots. <laughs> More than I can keep count of. Okay. I really wish I was there with you to do those uh, tour of the markets on a Sunday. <laughs> oh my God, I know, it looks so great. It's been pretty cool, pretty awesome, yeah. It was really well, a cool a couple of weekends ago. We went to... Um, another city which has got uh, all the Sheila period archaeological sites and because I was with the head of my department he spoke to a few people who spoke to a few other people who spoke to the director of one of the museums and excavations and we got to actually walk on one of the actual digs that was happening and see all the archaeology on the ground and there were lots of other people sort of walk, pointing and going why is she allowed to walk on this? <laughs> mm. Ooh. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, that's great. We're we're all going to come and um, you know, come to Korea for the Korea group meeting. So yeah, absolutely. Yes, <laughs> whether you want us or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're all invited, but yeah. <laughs> okay, we are actually now back. Oh, hi Cameron. Um back on schedule we should be starting now our next paper is by chad hill chad i turn it to, over to you oh hold on no i've managed to <laughs> green okay <clears throat> here we go yes okay uh <laughs> thanks very much i'm uh so glad to have this conference be going uh through now um and have you all here talk about Uncover 6K. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the, this project, this part of the project we've been working on for building a new per capita land use uh, database that can be applied um, potentially to a ALCC models. <clears throat> this is work that's been, I'm going to talk about it, but it's a product of um, effort by many people who have either contributed uh, work on the database or uh, values to the database. Um, so this is also on behalf of all, all the people listed here. Um, so uh, this is a version of one of the slides that uh, Marie Jose showed, um, the outline of the land cover 6K <clears throat> um, uh, roadmap. And we are, for talking about this squarely in the uh, archaeology section, um, in, uh, land use uh, part of land cover 6K. Um, using archaeological data to get at this data. Uh, so we know, as as Sir Kathy has already talked about, um, <laughs> one of the difficulties with uh, and, and and highlighted really also by uh, Earl and uh, Case, um, uh, we know that this sort of archaeologists we've we've talked to this already. Archaeologists are not really used to synthesizing data at the global scale and contributing data. Um, in a way that makes it useful outside of archaeology in this way. Um, it's, it's a slow process and, and all of the papers that are going to be on the regional sessions are really talking about how um, really regionally specific and, and, and slow of a process it is to get from archaeological data to uh, reconstructions of land use um, <clears throat> due to all these sort of underlying uh, difficulties. So one additional question we have is how, how else can archaeological and anthropological data be relevant um, in this uh, realm? And so one way uh, for sure is by trying to help improve models of per capita land use through time, which is what we're talking about here, right? So of course, uh, per capita land use, we're talking about the uh, area required per person for subsistence. And when combined 
with uh, population models can be used to calculate total land use um, at various points. It is though difficult to reconstruct uh, the per capita land use requirements at a global scale with sufficient resolution earlier than uh, 1960 when there's widespread easily accessible uh, data on varying uh, the variation of uh, per capita land use through FAO data. But uh, ALCC models rely on per capita land use estimates to reconstruct land cover change through time. So this is a critical um, part, as, as Case has already mentioned, of uh, anthropogenic land cover change models, but it's a little bit difficult um, to get it. Uh, so historically, um, anthropogenic land cover change models have assumed relatively a uh, few differences in per capita land use within land use categories. They've, um, uh, by necessity, used relatively simplistic models of per capita land use through time. Um, so I know that uh, Hyde 3.1 had only used uh, well, one per capita land use value for agriculture back in time. This changed into um, version 3.2 and KK10 had used uh, changing per capita land use, but primarily um, changing based on population. And this limitation of not having a uh, particularly nuanced um, ability to describe differences in per capita land use at different time periods and regions uh, creates a limited model of past land use that can potentially uh, be improved. Um, so this is what we've been working on is uh, building a new historical per capita land use database trying to capture from a variety of sources uh, the full scope of how we can find evidence for uh, per capita land use having varied in different ways through time and across space uh, globally. So building up a much more nuanced picture of how per capita land use has uh, existed um, in the past. And so this database really was started by uh, Kathy several years ago, and uh, we've been adding to it uh, very recently to build up a, a this, this um, large database of values from different sources. And so we're drawing um, from, from many ethnographic and historic uh, sources uh, where people have reported either directly uh, calculated per capita land use sometimes in the uh, units that we expected, that, that we wanted to be in per uh, hectares per capita, and sometimes by just uh, talking about the population of the group that is being studied and the amount of area that they were using for uh, subsistence. And so then we're calculating uh, PCLU from these sources. Uh, we're using a little bit of uh, the sampling the modern data since 1960, but this isn't really the, the goal of this database um, because this data is widely available from uh, the modern FAO data. So we've just had a, like a decadal sample uh, from 1960 to the present. And uh, to some extent from historical values that are calculated from archaeological and climatic data, um, things like the uh, pages Ryan Lucif's data who have supplied a uh, number of um, PCLU values um for europe uh, so the, the product of uh pulling from all these sources is we have a, a database with um nearly 2000 uh, values of per capita land use that uh, spans the globe and a fairly deep time depth um so this is a uh plot um of the global distribution of the per capita land use values that we have in the database um, and the both the spatial distribution of these values and the temporal distribution of these values is not even so you can see that although we have um, we've tried to have at least a few values from as many places as possible uh, they do tend to cluster um, in a few places so in the US and China we have the most values and um, in other places we have much less similarly um, we have, I'll talk about this in a second, um, the, even, even discounting the last 60 years, uh, the data is heavily skewed towards recent uh, periods, so it's much easier um, uh, to get at per capita land use when we have uh, direct evidence for it. Um, so 
uh, there's twice as many uh, date, uh, dates that are in the last 300 years as uh, dates that are earlier. Um, and uh, there's significant overrepresentation of agriculture values versus um, uh, either pastoralism or hunter gathered fishing foragers. Right, so we have some values from nearly every country, but many more values from the past 200 years than the previous 7,000, um, and nearly two times as many uh, values for agriculture as for pastoralism or hunter gathering, fishing, foraging combined. And, and those have very similar values. Uh, this data is collected from sources with uh, differing quality because it's coming from different, uh, it's constructed differently. It's either from um, things that have been measured or that are being estimated from archaeological data. Um, so there's differing uh, reliability of some of these values. The, some of the PCLUs are reported directly in the literature, some we're having to calculate. Uh, in terms of the spatial structure of this database, it's structured by national boundaries. Um, so per country, uh, the database is, is uh, for entire countries. Uh, this makes it easier to connect to um, ALCC models that are using the same uh, boundaries. Um, and because in many cases, that's the, the most specific that we, that some of these sources can be for the value. So it'll be the whole country um, has where possible, uh, we include the subregion that would be much more helpful about what um, environmental conditions are, are um, related here. And then also where possible, we're including uh, the land use category from LC6K's database stru uh, classification structure. So uh, land use one, land use two, land use three, whether it's um, these are values for agriculture, but then hopefully more specifically, what kind of agriculture or what kind of pastoralism. So we can get it more nuanced differentiation between uh, um, groups. Uh, this builds on um, the work by Case uh, from 2017, where uh, he's drawing um, per capita land use values uh, globally and temporally, but it's drawing uh, new, date, uh, new data from um, uh, over 180 uh, sources additionally. <clears throat> so we have uh, this, this broad uh, group of per capita land use values and we can find some patterns that we really expect um, re reflecting the significant differences um, between the level one land use categories, so between um, pastoralism, agriculture, and hunter-gathering, fishing, foraging, uh, that as you would imagine, the smallest values of per capita land use are for uh, found for agriculture. This is comparing the three, and there's significant overlap with pastoralism, but uh, with generally larger values, and that hunter-gathering, fishing, foraging uses significantly more land uh, per person than uh, either uh, agriculture or pastoralism. What is uh, really astonishing, I think, is the the some the range of values that are possible uh, in the reported literature for hunting, gathering, fishing, foraging. This um, the scale here is is not linear. Um, so the range in in values for hunting, gathering, fishing, foraging can be between 100 and 10,000 hectares per capita, depending on where we're talking about. And this really probably reflects. Um, things like uh, the differences in um, environmental conditions where people are uh, foraging and um, things like long-term uh, modification or management of ecosystems by foragers that can be extremely variable. And I think this is uh, important data to be able to get it. Um, and it, it's difficult to, to find um, people talking about this. We can also, because we're um, uh, including data to the uh, land use level to um, classification level, uh, make important distinctions among uh, land use types, uh, among the same kinds of subsistence strategies. So we have sufficient data to separate uh, values between um, different kinds of agriculture, different kinds of pastoralism. And as we would expect, we get large differences between these uh, classifications. So um, uh, wet cultivation has the lowest um, range uh, of, of any of the land use categories and in agriculture, then um, it's significantly more for uh, Swidner shifting and um, 
uh, herbaceous ground crops, and both of the all of these are smaller than the ranges for uh, types of pastoralism like ranching and uh, mobile pastoralism. So we get we can differentiate more uh, broadly here than um, uh, just to the, the level of um, primary categories. And what else can we learn from PCLU variation? Um, have environmental conditions limited the number of people supported by a given unit of land? Can we uh, um, find the expect relationships we would expect between uh, environment and the amount of land required to feed people? Um, so we expect a strong relationship between environmental conditions and per capita land use requirements, regardless of time period or subsistence strategy. Um, and to some extent, we can see that. Uh, so this is tracking um, uh, per capita land use values against uh, KG classes. And there's some degree of uh, uh, um, correlation here, but national boundaries are in many cases too coarse for doing this, especially when we have dozens of uh, um, uh, um, types of, of uh, classification available for one country. So we really need some national boundaries uh, to, to be able to pull this together better for um, the, especially the places where we have the most per capita land use values that it, uh, in the US, for instance. And we can get a little bit at that with uh, this database. We also wanna know about diachronic uh, change in um, per capita land use. We know that uh, per capita land use goes down through time also in relationship to changing uh, um, population levels. And to some extent, we can do that with this database, uh, even though there is much fewer uh, per capita land use values for earlier time periods than for more recent time periods. Um, this is something that uh, uh, Case had worked on in this 2017 paper, uh, also which focuses on finding specific um, examples of diachronic change that can then be extrapolated, um, like for instance, this plot showing um, per capita land use through time just in, in China, we can see this uh, dramatic decline in values. But our database is also building a more comprehensive aggregation of values. Uh, so we get more um, time depth in entire regions, not, uh, not just being limited to trying to have one complete record in one country. Um, so we can also in this in our in our database see this decrease in time uh, in uh, per capita land use um, towards the present. Although uh, I would say the highlight the, the time scale here, um, which is that we have only a few reconstructions for uh, um, uh, more than 2000 years ago and, and most of the, the data is from the last uh, 2,000 years or the last 300 years. Um, so in, in general, this, this database is, is, is great. It's giving us increased nuance uh, for major categories of land use, especially at the level one use. This first uh, graph that I showed that really pulls apart um, sort of how hunter gathering, fishing, foraging relates to uh, land use uh, versus um, uh, subsistence strategies that uh, require domestication. We get more fine grain variation within these land use categories, uh, being able to track things like um, potentially wild resource management uh, amongst um, foraging groups or the effects of agricultural technologies uh, through time, potentially uh, get at shifts in surplus production. So our, our database captures some of that variation um, and lets us get to the sort of level uh, land use two level um, and greater time depth. Uh, so, uh, is this useful uh, for archaeologists for ALCC models? Um, it is a it's a novel resource to examine changing land use through time and space. Oh, I don't know why my text is going off the edge here. It tracks variations among and between subsistence strategies, time periods, and regions. Um, but there is just this significant limit on the availability of uh, per capita land use data before 1960. We have 1,800 values in this database. Um, but it's hard to get enough of them in one place to really build uh, these diachronic uh, change models. So will these values make a significant difference for ALCC models like Hyde? Uh, this is a, an open question. Um, we're to keep talking to Case about this. Uh, 
uh, will it be more than sort of already um, increased uh, variation of uh, per capita land use in the existing models? I think it'd be it'll be really interesting to see if the, the sort of breadth of uh, hunting, gathering, fishing, foraging, for instance, can be um, of value. But also a different approach that uh, is, might be necessary to capture more of the archaeological data for reconstructing land use in the past. This is the main output goal of the archaeology and land use side of land cover 6K, um, maybe needed for uh, some, some of the crucial variables in human land use that are not adequately captured by the limited PCLU uh, data that we have. So things like um, human production that it, it exists beyond the just the necessary food production per person, but things like surplus production. Um, so thank you very much uh, for listening to this um, about uh, land cover 6K and the per capita land use um, bit. Let me see, do we have any questions? I have lost my chat bar. Okay, I'm, I'm on it too, and I don't see any questions right now. Feel free to ask. Maybe chat if you could stop sharing, we could see the faces. Thank you. Yeah, Case. Yeah, uh, just one remark. Uh, th thank you, Chad, for this. Um, I think it's very valuable. Uh, I would be already very uh, happy if this PCLU uh, database or the people involved in this could at least give me some kind of range or a maximum. For the deep past so it's certainly not ever larger anywhere in the world than five hectares per person something like that so i can limit just my database whatever i do it has to be lower than that mm. that already would help me i think for sure this is uh <laughs> something that exists in this uh, that can be extracted from here yes yeah yeah and i'm i'm not uh, afraid to really upscale your estimates from the pclu uh, database into other regions where you don't have any data. I'll, I'll, I'll just, okay, this is what I do. I just took the numbers and assumed it's the same there and go from there. Anything um, else? Oh, sorry. Marie Jose has a, has a uh, uh, PCLU. People are not using the chat. <laughs> yeah, she's using the chat. the organizers are the she's worst. Saying, right? she's I using am the using chat. the chat. You yeah. put it in the chat. Oh, there you are. How but are you'll you? never okay. see. <laughs> Uh, so yeah. I, I, um, I don't know, maybe it's not right to say climatic data, but uh, that it's from um, uh, models of uh, sort of these complex models of using site-based data uh, to reconstruct the areas around sites that, that are associated with a particular uh, site uh, to get it sort of the, the, the uh, catchment area around it. And then um, the difficulty of reconstructing population uh, models for those sites can be mapped onto the area around the site that must be that must go with each archaeological site rather than uh, another the, the, the next archaeological site over. So this works great um, for <laughs> as 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 all things that we talk about for this uh, works great in areas where you have the most dense uh, uh, archaeological site knowledge. So right. in, in Europe, for sure. Um, I think the question too is that the PCLU data are not calculated from climatic data. They're broke. That was that one chart was broken down by climatic zone, right? Because we were very interested in the range of variability in different climatic zones, right? If you think about hunting and gathering, you know, it's often like these Arctic um, sort of cold climate hunter gatherers use vast, vast territories, right? So the particularly for hunting, gathering, fishing those kinds of ranges are very environmentally linked, you know, not fully determined, of course, but very closely connected to environmental variation. So that's something we were, we're trying to capture in that. It is, it is difficult to get uh, just from archeological data uh, to the area around individual sites that would be used, right? This is a, a challenge and this is why there's not more of this data available. Right. And, and there's certainly scope, I would say, case to, um, you know, sort of iteratively use this in the sense that we have good PCLU data for, for example, wet rice cultivation, you know, in, in, in several different places, mm -hmm. not every place where there was wet, wet rice cultivation, but, but once, you know, we get our 
co complete our maps and we know where wet rice cultivation was at a particular point, then presumably we can apply that PCLU even you know more broadly than the source. Yeah, yeah. sounds good. Uh, Nikki. So, so yeah, it's a slightly yeah. tongue-in-cheek question about um, being able to take the calculation of land use data, combine it with a PCLU to give us a population number. I kind of fancy doing that. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts, Chad? Uh, yeah, I'm worried that this is putting the, the order in the wrong direction. Uh. Mm, I know, <laughs> I know, but it's so tempting. <laughs> It would be fun if and scary, I think. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I have actually calculated the, the area from the data that Chad sent me quite recently. It was higher than I was anticipating. Um, but yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a fun exercise though. Mm. If potentially destabilizing to our morale. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, if there's nothing else, we're right on time, perfectly on time. So our next paper and our last paper in today's session is by uh, Andrea Dawson. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm just gonna share my screen. All right, so um, I'd like to start by um, thanking everyone for the opportunity to give this talk. Um, I've heard some really interesting stuff so far and look forward to the rest of the talks. Um, today, I'm gonna to share some general thoughts uh, as well as some um, work in progress, both related to reconstructing land cover change from fossil pollen, particularly focused on North America. And so my work is motivated um, primarily by the desire to improve future predictions, probably like, like most of us are, um, predictions about the Earth system. And so we make these predictions using models, land use models, ecosystem models, Earth system models. Um, and when these models make predictions about ecosystem states, as we've seen, um, there is a lack of agreement. So this figure shows the, the land carbon sink for a suite of models. And we can see that there is room for improvement. And that's where the paleoecological record can help. And so to do this, we need to do what I call bridging time scales. And so these models are typically constrained or parameterized using modern observations. And that period, the modern period, what we call the modern period is really short in terms of the geological time scale. Um, and so some of the processes that we're actually interested in learning about operate at much longer time scales than the modern period. So centennial to millennial or even longer. And so if we can figure out how to bridge from the paleoecological record to this um, you know, model um, framework, then we have the opportunity to improve these future predictions. And so more specifically, um, paleoecological data can provide information about all kinds of things, um, including you know, how ecosystems have responded to rapid climate change in the past, which can tell us about how you know, composition, structure, and communities uh, change or their potential to change can also tell us about natural variability um, and biogeo biogeochemical cycles, like, like the carbon cycle, for example. And then additionally, can be used to constrain these models. Um, but to do this, we need to translate this paleoecological data into a quantity of interest. So right now, you can't just plug in pollen counts into, you know, for example, a land use model or an ecosystem model. Um, and so to constrain these models, um, typically what's also needed is a product that is comprehensive in both space and sometimes time as well. And so doing this is um, 
you know, more possible now than it used to be because of the improvements with respect to data uh, sharing and accessibility. And so um, this is a map uh, of North America showing locations of pollen records, fossil pollen records from the Neotoma paleoecology database. And the darker points indicate records that extend further back through time. Um, so to sometimes to the last glacial maximum. And then the lighter points indicate shorter records in time. So you can see there is a wealth of data to work with here. And to actually translate that data into a quantity of interest, um, like vegetation is typically what we're interested in, or you know, land cover, which is a characteristic of vegetation, we need to build a model that will translate those pollen counts into this quantity of interest. And so that means thinking about the processes that link those things together. And the three uh, processes that we typically think about, the ones that are, uh, I guess, most important for this link include this differential production. So this idea that, um, you know, different trees, different taxa uh, produce different amounts of pollen. Dispersal, which is a complicated process depending on atmospheric conditions, um, you know, forest structure and all kinds of other things. And then this process of deposition and sedimentation. And so this um, need to develop uh, these spatially comprehensive products, um, you know, in the context of these processes seems impossible if we don't have data everywhere in space, but with vegetation, there is spatial dependence. So this idea that if you have two um, locations, you know, forested locations that are close together, we expect the forest to be more similar than two locations that are further apart. And so we can actually make use of this relationship in a model um, to get something that is spatially comprehensive. And so down here, um, the details of this figure aren't so important, but this is one way, so linking vegetation and pollen data in a way that accounts for the spatial dependence to get predictions that are spatially comprehensive. So the other issue that we have to deal with um, with respect to space is a sampling bias. And so you can see this map again, um, you know, there are some regions where the, you know, there's the data density is really high. For example, this upper Midwestern United States, um, but there are regions of North America that are very uh, sparse. The data is very sparse. And so if we're trying to fill those in, um, using some sort of model, we're going to have much higher uncertainty when we are far away from data points. And so we need to keep that in mind as we develop these uh, spatially comprehensive products. So I guess, I guess I will say there are a few reasons why we might not have samples there. One is that uh, typically paleoecologists have a favorite place to work. <laughs> Upper Midwest happens to be a paleoecological hotspot in North America. Um, but also there might not be, uh, you know, suitable depositional environments in some places. And so the other thing that we need to think about when we're translating from these fossil pollen counts to uh, the vegetation quantity of interest is this concept of time. And so, you know, I think we're all familiar with this idea, um, but in particular, associating depth with age is, um, it's hard. Um, so this involves typically for the time period that I work in, um, going from radiocarbon age to calendar age. And I, I have a research assistant now who is trying to characterize the uncertainty in age depth models um, as a function of um, you know, error in radiocarbon dates. And so she's doing some interesting work that looks at that error and how it depends on you know, the radiocarbon dating method used, um, the type of material that's being dated, um, and so on. And so here are just a, you know, a list of a, a few of the sources of uncertainty that impact the age estimates associated with our pollen samples. 
And so for the, the work that I'm going to show in a minute, um, we use that data from that map of North America, the, the map with the points on it. Um, and that data, um, you know, how to those, I guess those sites have age death models that were developed in a variety of ways using a variety of methods. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was to redevelop those age death models so that we had some standardization of um, you know, the method that we use. And so to do that, we used uh, BCRON, which is a Bayesian age depth approach. And here is an example of an age depth model um, that came out of BCRON. So the other thing that I wanted to explicitly put in here, because I, I you know, this thinking about uncertainty um, underpins like all of the work that I, that I do. So this idea that, you know, if we have some data and we want to make a prediction, um, you know, if we make a point prediction, we know that that prediction is wrong. So with certainty, that prediction will be wrong if it's a, if it's a point estimate. Um, and so really, um, if we are able to characterize the uncertainty associated with that prediction, we have more information. And so um, I, I, I really advocate um, for approaches that do allow for this characterization of uncertainty. Okay, so I'm gonna highlight uh, just a few things that I've been working on related to uh, Land Cover 6K. Um, so a project where we are using re reveals to reconstruct land cover for North America, um, some Bayesian approaches to reconstructing land cover, um, biotic velocity, estimating biotic velocity from fossil pollen. I'm not going to talk about the albedo stuff, which is why it's grayed out, um, but I have a, a student right now who is reconstructing albedo from fossil pollen, and there's been some really interesting stuff to come out of that. And then finally, uh, data assimilation. So this formal, um, you know, this formal way to join the mo a model and um, some data together. And so for reveals, um, this is work that's done in collaboration with a lot of the people that are here um, on this call and some others. And so here is a map. This shows the fraction of open land. So percent open land from 8,000 years before present to 50 years before present. So here's 8,000, 6,000. And it's hard to really see the changes because there are some idiosyncrasies and, you know, in this. Um, but one thing that we can do is use this to inform these spatially comprehensive uh, data products. Um, and so using those reveals estimates um, in collaboration with some other people that have also generated reveals um, estimates, we have put together this map of um, open land for the Northern Hemisphere. And this map actually shows the difference between 6,000 years before present and 3,000 years before present. So fraction open land. And so here red indicates more open land in the 3000 years before present time and blue indicates less. So some, some of the patterns here are quite clear. So in Europe, um, well, in Scandinavia, there is uh, more open land as we move forward in time. Okay, so um, I've done a lot of work trying to develop these Bayesian spatiotemporal approaches that allow us to use pollen count data directly and get this space-time comprehensive product out. And so we do this by accounting for that spatial dependence but also accounting for this temporal dependence. So this idea that these pollen counts are linked, you know, it, a particular um, pollen record, you know, those two samples from that pollen record from different depths that represent different, you know, times are not independent from each other. 
And so we can actually account for this in a model in this Bayesian framework. And one of the benefits of doing this is that it allows us to model all of the taxa jointly and characterize uncertainty so that what we get out um, aren't these point estimates, but it is a posterior distribution. So a range of potential values for the parameters that we're interested in, like fraction of open land. And so using an approach like this, um, you know, what we get out are maps of forest change. This shows hemlock from 10,000 years before present to 350 years before present and the associated uncertainty through time. And so this allows us to, um, to look at how different taxa move across the landscape and how the relative abundance of them changes through time. And so others have done some really interesting work um, along this line of thinking. And so this is work um, from Ben Az, and I know she's continued to do some really great work. This is from a paper in 2018. And so what they were doing, um, you know, they had the same objective. We have this sort of sparse, spatially sparse product, and we want it to be spatially comprehensive. And so to do that, they can account for spatial dependence. So same line of thinking. And so here uh, are the reveals. So this leftmost column, the reveals um, estimates that come from pollen. And then they developed some different models and compared that to what's in this fourth column, which is some data. And so this is for a modern period. And you can see that their models, their modeled um, land cover matches the data quite well. And one of the reasons why they are able to do this is because they use some covariates that come from um, land use or ecosystem models. Okay, so I have a postdoc right now, Alyssa Brown, who is continuing to develop these Bayesian spatiotemporal methods. So those first maps that I showed, I guess I didn't tell you where it was, the hemlock map, <laughs> you know, was a, was a, a very local uh, region in North America, the upper Midwest, that hot spot of paleoecology. Um, and so the problem with that approach um, is that it was really computationally expensive. And so Alyssa, the postdoc, is now trying to develop an approach that does uh, the same sort of thing, but doesn't take as long to, um, to, to, to run the model or estimate the parameters. And so she does that using um, using results from a nice paper that I'm not, I'm not going to talk about here, but it's a, you know, a, 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 a statistical approach to rewrite part of the model that makes it easier to actually do this parameter estimation step. And so she has um, done this for Eastern North America. So this is for um, Piscea, so spruce. We have the relative abundance, the mean, and then the uncertainty as well. Okay, and so her work is um, actually part of a larger project that tries to address um, what's known as Reed's paradox. And so I wanted to highlight it here because I, I, I think it's um, interesting to think about combining these different data types together. And so Reed's paradox um, asks the question as to why these rates of movement of trees across the landscape are so different orders of magnitude different when we estimate them from different data types. And so the fossil pollen um, rate of movement is much larger than the rate of movement estimated from genetic data. And that in turn is much larger than the rate of movement estimated from seeds. So thinking about seed dispersal. And so this led to um, an idea that it would be uh, worth trying to integrate these data types into a coherent modeling framework to see if we can reconcile um, these differences. And so this is, um, so these are results from that work and this is very much still a work in progress. And so these three figures show biotic velocity. So that's a rate of movement. So meters per year are the units here 
through time. So from the last glacial maximum on the left of the x-axis all the way up to um, you know, more or less today. And the one uh, in blue is um, estimated from genetic data alone. And then the top one in this pink color is the genetic data plus results from a niche model. So the niche model is developed using occurrence data and global circulation model um, climate output. And then this yellow one is genetic data plus fossil pollen. And so we can see that these, um, these I guess we'll call them peaks. So there, there are really two modes here, uh, two periods in which biotic velocity seems to increase from the pollen data. And those actually correspond with some periods um, of climatic events that, that um, I guess we know about. And so finally, I wanted to mention uh, data assimilation. And so this is one way to um, allow these products to come out of the fossil pollen data to uh, constrain models. And so how this works in the project that I am highlighting right now um, is, uh, you know, we have a model that makes predictions about an ecosystem state. And so one of those times that that model makes prediction, you know, we might have um, information from data as well. So we have a model prediction and some data and the process of data assimilation um, uh, makes a compromise between the model and data. So essentially updating that ecosystem state. And there are different ways to do that. So um, with that compromise, then the model uses that compromise to make predictions about that state at the next time step and so on. And so this is work done by Anne Rejo, who's currently a postdoc at um, NASA. And so she is taking results from that Bayesian space time, um, you know, the Bayesian space time forest maps um, and uncertainty and assimilating that forest composition into an ecosystem model called linkages. And so this um, you know, model forecast and data are used to constrain here, it's above ground biomass. And um, so that's the column on the right. And there are three rows here indicating the frequency with which that data assimilation is done, right? So the model operates on time steps that are much, um, I guess the time intervals are much shorter than what we have from the data products that come from the fossil pollen. And so depending on how frequently you do this assimilation step, you get um, more or less pronounced uh, seesaw patterns. So you're constraining and then the model veers away from the data and then you constrain it again and so on. And so this, you know, formal data assimilation process is still, you know, something that is being developed in the literature um, with respect to, uh, I guess, ecosystem models and paleo data, but this is something that the climate uh, modeling community has done, um, you know, much more work in. So we can learn from them. Um, and so one of the interesting things that came out of this is, um, you know, the ability to identify these different climatic events. So for example, um, they identified the impacts of a volcano and then were able to quantify, I guess, the ecological memory of the ecosystem to a big event like that, um, which I think is, is really the first time people have been able to do that with an ecosystem model from data, using, using data to constrain that model. Okay, so I'm going to finish there. Um, I wanted to uh, just have some general <laughs> comments about the way forward. Um, and so um, you've already heard me plug this, uh, this, this idea of uncertainty quantification. And so I think that um, having improved approaches to do that will actually get us uh, you know, much further along in terms of our understanding about how certain we are uh, about these forecasts and these changes in the past. 
Um, none of this work would be possible without, you know, open data and science. So I strongly advocate for that as well. Um, and then finally, and I mean, this is particularly relevant to pages and land cover 6K, this interdisciplinary and global collaboration. So this, um, you know, these projects that bring these people together, like we're hearing about throughout this whole uh, conference, really benefit from these organizations that allow us to do things like this and connect. Um, so I'll finish by thanking everybody, especially the students that did all of the work. Um, yeah, so I'll stop there. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much, Andrea. I'm sure there must be some questions, <laughs> comments, thoughts. Looking in the chat, I always seem to get it kind of later than other people. So, yeah, I don't. Have, yeah, I'm with you. Mine, mine is <laughs> delayed too. <laughs> yeah. So I will say, Anne, maybe I am the person that can help you with that North American reveal <laughs> stuff. Yes, I mean the 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 work in North America is quite impressive. It would be wonderful to see it connected like that. Andre, uh, Marie Jose. Yeah, it's so it's so silent. Oh, that was maybe a question. No, no I I just wanted to tell you, Andrea, that it it's it was excellent to, that you uh, showed the, these other ways to do things. <laughs> And, and what we can do in, in the future. So th this is really great. I, I just have a, a question in relation to a uh, comparison with, with uh, or, or use with climate data, uh, climate models, sorry. Uh, could, because from the, data, uh, the reconstruction you have shown, it seems that you have, uh done it for uh, for a few time windows is it right uh, through the holocene or did you do it continuously as as we have done for china and, and europe uh so a continue so the reconstructions that i was showing i guess from Alyssa, which is the most recent work go back to the last glacial maximum um and so depending okay. on how, how much data we have those like the time um the width of the time intervals that we use in the model can can vary right we can we can specify that okay so so you you have a kind of tra transient reveals reconstructions for for northern america yeah but as we go like as we get back to lgm there aren't a lot of Pollen records, and so the no, 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 of course, but I mean for the last time. eight, the for the last ten uh, k. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's great. That is great. Any other? Okay, maybe Andre, if you could stop sharing your screen, I can. That would be great. I think I can. So then I think my last, oh, okay. Here, Nikki has a question, um, how we can better capture the uncertainty within archeological data sets. You can probably see that in the chat yourself. Can you see it, Andrea? Um, I can, and I don't know if I know the answer because I'm not an archeologist. <laughs> um, I mean, I think any time that we're making decisions about including or excluding things, um, you know, if we're being systematic about it, there would be a way to formalize that, but without being familiar with the data, then I, mm. I don't, I don't really know what the answer is. I, mm. I don't have like a magic, a magic. No, one. I know, I know. I'm not asking you for a magic one, but <laughs> it just occurred to me that, um, I am slightly uncomfortable about aspects of decisions that we've taken sometimes, and I would like to have a much better sense of the effects of those decisions and the uncertainty associated with those. Uh, I guess, you know, we've had to make decisions on the basis of it being expedient, 
uh, but it would be nice to understand better what the effects of those would be. And yeah, I'm not sure archaeologists are terribly good about thinking about uncertainty, <laughs> apart from in chronology, you know, we've kind of learned about that, but beyond that, I, I wonder. Anyway, so a little bit of a ramble, maybe I could talk with you at some point. <laughs> sure, I'd love, to, I'd love to talk. I mean, so one of the challenges, and everybody probably knows this, one of the challenges with these like Bayesian spatiotemporal models is that, you know, you need to have some background in that to be able to do it, right? Mm. And so collaborating becomes really important because we can't all know everything. Right. Um, right. And so, yeah. I mean, one of the reasons I can, I, I do that, my background is in math. And so I bring, I bring that to uh, collaboration. Like my research is very much in this, in this land cover six K world, but it, yeah. Right. So and I don't love, I don't love that about the approach that, you know. So maybe the magic wand is math. <laughs> oh, Mark, Marco. <laughs> I should have just, that should have been my, my talk. <laughs> you put that in your next PowerPoint. Mark, Marco, uh, is it a question? Also the model of Bayesian time yeah. space could be applied to archeological data with different mm. proxies also, mm. right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's not a question. I think it's just this comment on the thing. And mm. I think it's an interesting concept, concept that mm. could be used also for archeological data sets. Because we yeah. have the similar kind of problem, actually, probably amplify sometimes. So it could be mm. an interesting way to look at. Well, wonderful. So as this morning's, uh, at least for me, morning uh, program chair, <laughs> let me thank all of the presenters for keeping to good time. Uh, we're pretty much exactly on time now for today. Thank you all so much. And thank everybody for their interesting questions and comments. Um, we're finished for today, but there'll be another session um, uh, December 3rd, tomorrow, 11 a.m. GMT, two sessions, yes. Uh, but the first one is, uh, you know, very early from the North American point of view, so I'm sorry I will not be with you for all of it, um, starting at 11 GMT. And then we will have um, the second session in this exact same time slot tomorrow, um, starting at one o'clock GMT. So please, you know, come back, come back for more. And I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon, evening, night, morning, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>